Hello and welcome to our next edition of our Viva Vegan podcast. Now there's a few reasons why this episode is special this month. Firstly, it's our birthday! (laughs) So it's absolutely amazing to have been able to do 12 episodes and reach our first year of the podcast. Thanks so much for your ongoing support and kind comments. Your feedback about the show helps us with our up and coming content, so please keep that coming. You can leave messages on our speak pipe button by going to viva.org.uk forward slash viva podcast. Now, not only is it our birthday, but it's also World Vegan Day. So we have a big celebration of that day where we celebrate everything vegan. Remember, World Vegan Day might be a day, but we're vegan every day. We've got some fantastic content coming on this month's show. I met Viva patron and political poet Benjamin Zephaniah. Now, Benjamin's been a long supporter of Viva, hence the patron. I met up with him before his gig in Bristol recently and had a a wonderful interview, which we're going to share with you in two parts today. We also hear from our Vegan Recipe Club, who have now just launched the all-new Singing and Dancing 30 Day Vegan. It's a great way of getting people to try vegan for the first time. We give you the latest about our Bring Hope to Millions campaign, where we've managed to raise over £100,000 thanks to you. We chat with Sophie, our festival's manager, about our up-and-coming Sheffield Viva Vegan Festival. We showcase Veronica Powell's interview on Farming Today about dairy and iodine. We also cover George Monbiot, the Guardian journalist, who wrote a feature called How Dairy Killed a River, and then followed on by going on Good Morning Britain with Piers Morgan. Ouch! That was painful viewing, considering he went in preaching about veganism wearing a leather watch. He certainly provided Piers Morgan with some ammunition on that occasion. Alongside that, we have the usual news, views and interviews. Remember to subscribe and share wherever possible, and you can subscribe on all major platforms. Enjoy the show. Yo, yo, yo. My name is Benjamin Zephaniah, coming down your podcast wire. You're listening to Chris Townsend presenting Viva's Vegan Podcast. Check it out every month for the latest vegan news, views and interviews. You feel me? Yeah, it's a vegan thing. Love it. As many of you are aware, recently we launched the Bring Hope to Millions campaign where we wanted to raise £100,000 to show Britain's first ever vegan cinema ad. It was going to be featuring Rescued Pig Hope and we said it was guaranteed to reach an audience of 2.2 million ordinary cinema goers if we raised the money. Well, I'm so, so pleased to say that with your help we have... It was a massive success. Thank you for your support. We managed to raise in total 102,082 pence. Now, the crowdfunding for this campaign has now ended. We have the ad, we have the rating, and now we've raised the media fees. So thanks again for all your help with regards to this. We couldn't have done it without you. The purpose of the advert is basically to bring people the truth, people that wouldn't normally see it, show them the actual contrast between Hope's life and the lives of the mums, the mother pigs who live out each day under the shadow of their own deaths. Now, our campaign, Hope Not Hell, will bring the contrast to life and share it with as many people as possible. Now, we've had generous donors supporting us to bring these stories to the eyes and ears of thousands of people through leaflets and other adverts, but this cinema ad really is saving the best till last. Now, we're approximating the total audience will be around 2,205,388 people. That sounds very specific, doesn't it? (laughs) I don't know if it will be that exactly, but that's approximately the reach that we're going to gain. So that's a pretty good deal. That's worked out at less than five pence per person. And we also had an amazingly generous donor who offered to match every single donation up to the value of £50,000. So here's the advert that will be rolled out across cinemas in the near future. All creatures can experience pleasure. She is a pig called Hope, rescued by Viva. This is her dance of joy at being outdoors for the first time. It's something most pigs will never know as 90% are factory farmed. Set them all free. Try vegan. Deliciously easy vegan recipes. Next up is a section on George Monbiot. Now... Piers Morgan branded his views a hypocrisy in a very extremely heated debate on Good Morning Britain. 
The host challenged George and his opinions, and he was quick to call out George who appeared on the programme wearing a leather watch strap and shoes. Now, it really, really wasn't a good idea to do that. It just gave someone like Piers Morgan ammunition to slay him. But, you know, what George has to say is really important. What will future generations think looking back at our age? Why don't you make your principal stand against wearing leather well, watches you know, and yeah, leather okay, shoes? Okay. Okay. I could wear a different watch yeah. strap, but you know... You don't, you choose not to. Well... Well, so I just bought the cheap watch strap, which so you was don't in the mind market. But this is really what it's about. In the conditions we're that's talking talking about, if it suits your watch and your shoes, about, that's my point. Oh, but Piers, listen, I can Why do you find that very hard to understand? Yes. No, well, well look, because well, I'm, not being, I'm, I'm not try, being absolutely about this. I'm finding it baffling that you I'm think it's perfectly absolute. okay to kill these animals in the way they're killed for your personal luxuries, but you don't want us to do it for food. A couple of years ago, I went down to spend the day beside this beautiful river in a really lovely part of the country. And it was a river which was meant to be thronging with life. There was meant to be water voles and salmon, kingfishers and all these really amazing creatures. I couldn't wait, I was really excited. When we got to the river, it was dead. There was nothing in it except sewage fungus. That was the only living organism that I could see. Every other thing had been killed. I was just flabbergasted by this. This was meant to be a special nature site. And then I found this pipe just pouring filth into the river. And I followed it up to this dairy farm. That slurry, that cow dish, and filled up and was overtopping and it was just pouring straight into the river. And I thought, this is an environmental disaster area. So I phoned the pollution hotline run by our agency in Britain called the Environment Agency. It's a bit like the Environmental Protection Agency in the US. Two weeks later, I phoned them up again and said, so what have you done? Oh, we decided not to take any action, sir, because we don't think it's a serious pollution incident. I said, what do you mean it's not a serious pollution incident? It's wiped out the whole river. And they said, yes, sir, but we could find no evidence of a fish kill. I said, well, of course you couldn't find any evidence of a fish kill. There aren't any fish left to kill. And they said, well, thanks very much for your complaint, sir. Goodbye. Click. And then I got two whistleblowers, both writing to me and said, this is routine, we've been instructed from the top not to enforce against incidents like this, basically dairy pollution, but dairy farms is just wiping out rivers left, right and centre. And I thought, right, well, if they're not going to regulate this industry, I'm not going to buy its products. I don't want to be complicit in the destruction of these beautiful ecosystems. I then started looking around the world and saw that the problem isn't just meat. The problem is dairy in a big way. The livestock industry is inherently no more sustainable than the fossil fuel industry. The footprint of the global transport sector is pretty well the same as the footprint of animal agriculture. The rate of soil loss is now so great that we have 60 years of harvest left. And a lot of that is driven by the need to grow huge amount of crops in order to feed the animals which we then eat. There's been a big drive to say, so what we need to do is to eat free-range meat instead. And all you're doing there is swapping one crisis, which is an animal welfare crisis, for a different one, which is an environmental crisis. That free-range beef and free-range sheep is even more environmentally damaging than the indoor intensive production of meat, because it's fantastically inefficient. You often hear people tell you, well, it's our destiny to eat meat. Look at our teeth. You can see from our dentition that we've eaten meat in the past. And sure, of course, yeah, absolutely. And we've killed people in the past and we've set light to rainforests in the past and a load of horrendous things in the past. That doesn't mean we have to keep doing them. We have choice. We have free will. I think if you want to go vegan, the first step is to start eating some vegan food. <laughs> go to a kebab shop and get a falafel. It's good vegan food. Thai food, some Southeast Asian cooking, there's some really amazing vegan meals you can do that way. And it's weird how your mind changes to accommodate the decisions that you make. It's a funny quirk of being human. And then quite unconsciously, we sort of justify that even to the extent of our senses. The taste of cheese is no longer pleasant to me. This thing I used to love, I don't love it anymore. It just does nothing for me at all. It's just grease on the tongue. So what would the impact of stopping eating animal products be? Well, the first impact it means that we would use much less land than we currently use. A calculation suggests it would be between a third and a half of the land that we currently use. And the rest of that land, we can leave it to nature. We can allow nature to come back. It could be one of the very few ecological success stories anywhere in the world. We could see a great restoration, a great rewilding 
of nature and that to me would be a wonderful thing. We can't detach ourselves anymore from the moral consequences of what we do. We can't say, oh, well, it's only me. What one person is doing is an aspect of what millions of people are doing because we're all induced to do the similar sorts of things through market forces, through advertising, through marketing. So when you see those climate disasters, when you see people flooded out of their homes, when you see places turning into desert, when you see crops no longer being able to grow because it's too hot, when you see hurricanes intensifying and smashing everything up, 15% of that is because of what we're eating. Well, that alone is enough reason to change. At Viva, we rely heavily on the gifts that people leave to us in their wills. Without this generosity from our supporters, we would not be able to do the crucial work that we do, investigating industrial farming and slaughter and saving animals. We also promote veganism to millions of people every year. Leave a legacy which will help make the world a better, kinder place after you are gone. Please consider giving to Viva in your will. To find out more, please visit viva.org.uk forward slash legacies or contact Tony Wardle by email on tony at viva.org.uk or call 0117 944-1000. Next up is an interview I did with Benjamin Zephaniah, vegan poet, writer and lyricist, and his insights into veganism are very, very interesting. OK, Benjamin, really good to see you. Thanks for, for coming and welcome to Bristol. Yeah, I'm back. Yeah, you're Bristol. back. Look, how long have you been vegan for now? I went vegan when I was 13. What do you think of the recent surge that's happened? Because you must have seen slow change and suddenly increasing at a, at a huge level. I find it really interesting. I mean... And good and positive. I know there's lots of people that will do it because it's fashionable now and all that kind of stuff, but there are some people that really, really care. Recently, I went to a veg fest in London. I was like, wow, I saw Muslims, I saw Buddhists, I saw Chinese, I saw Thai people, I saw there's a few English people there, people from Bristol, all, all over the world, basically. And I, I was really taken by it, you know. What I don't like much is the kind of... In some places, in Shoreditch and places like that, the kind of gentrification of veganism. So I went into a place every day and I bought a little cake like that and it was like £8. And I bought a little bit of almond milk and it was like £8. I think we need to blame the hipsters for that one though, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, you know, <laughs> that stuff gets me because that is what's put off for a long time. Sorry for using the term, but I, no, I'm not sorry for using the term, I beg your pardon. That's what puts off working class people who are struggling to earn a living. Mm. A lot of them see veganism as a kind of middle class lifestyle totally, choice. You know? yeah. I have to live amongst people who, you know, when you talk to them about, about veganism, they say, I've got three kids in tow. Right? I've got a push here. I've got this, that and the other. I can't read all the labels. I can't, you know, mm. I haven't got time to study this stuff. So I want convenience. You mm. know? And I understand that. And that's why... Um, we have to bring it to them. I tell you, to them. we have to make it more accessible. Yeah. We held a Viva Festival uh, in London at Wembley. The, the diversity was yeah. just incredible. Yeah. It, was, it was really good. And not just that, there are also a higher percentage of men there as well, full stop. Yeah. So I think the, the ratio between men and women that are into veganism yeah. has been really lopsided. Yeah. But I mean, sort of like 80-20, sort of which was uh, reassuring. You know, there's, you, you've probably come across organisations of vegan bodybuilders. Yeah, I know quite a few. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, what these guys have realised is that, you know, no one's ever died because of a lack of meat. They want protein from the meat. So why have all the other nasty stuff that comes with meat? Why not get pure protein from somewhere else? Mm. And you can still be a bodybuilder. Yeah. And I'm, I'm into sport. I'm not into bodybuilding as, that, as such. Um, but I kind of understand where they're coming from and why years and years of brainwashing, for want of a better term, mm led them to believe in the past that you know you had to have meat i'm not very good at kind of preaching i can't remember statistics and stuff like that when it comes to being vegan what i do now i'll just be an example nowadays as well you know having so many more athletes on board with veganism mm. making that switch my friend it was mr universe um not so long ago mm. and you know he's built you know mm. and um and he turned vegan three years ago and he wants to get the title back again as a vegan. Because right. some people are saying, oh, yeah, but you got that when you at meat, that sort of thing. Right. And he's like, right, well, this time I'm going to prove it to you. Right. you know, but there's plenty of other you know, amazing athletes that we have mm. sort, yes. of, sort of advocating yeah. for us and stuff as well, isn't it? We saw you perform at WOMAD this right. year. And as a result of that, I mean, it's an amazing place to hear your new album. You've now merged your poetry with music and, you know, and it fitted like a hand in glove. Was that a natural step to you? Well, I mean, my first album was in... 
1982, and it still sells now. So what would you um, say the difference is with this album that's come out? Well, the problem with my music, some people would say, is that it's not being consistent. Um, I've rejected a couple of offers where they've offered me kind of four or five record deals. I would say I'll do an album when I feel like it, mm. when I feel the political and spiritual need to do one. And they're all very different from each other. Mm. You know, who am I hanging out with at the time? Am I hanging out with hip-hop guys? Am I hanging out with jazz people? Mm. Um, yeah. And so, so that's very frustrating for record labels, you know. They, just, they want some consistency in how often I bring out records and can you still say records? <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah. Some of the younger people I might have to decipher. But <laughs> um, and also in, in, in style. But I'm cool with that, you know, um, because I don't see it as a career. If I see it as a career, maybe I'd be thinking about that kind of career projection or whatever it's called. Mm. I create music or a novel for that matter or poetry or a play, or whatever it is, when I feel the political and the spiritual and creative need to do it, mm. not to a contract. There's some things I've written for the album which may end up in a book, it may slightly be rewritten, that's happened before, and it's happened the other way around. In fact, the track More Animal Rights, which originally came from a book of poetry that right. I did, and I just slightly changed it. And yeah. Well, that works well with the backing track, doesn't it? Yeah. Can, you, can you tell me a little bit about that track, More Animal Rights? Because the, the, you know, I'm particularly interested in that as a vegan. It was a vegan song. And I'll tell you a quick story about Womad. It took me six cafes to find soya milk at one point. I couldn't believe it. Mm. Honestly, couldn't believe it. It was just getting ridiculous. And we felt a little bit sort of as an afterthought at one point. Right. And then, you know, it's like, where are the, where are the vegans? And when you came on and did that, you finally gave us a voice. <laughs> it was like, go, where are the vegans? It's like, yes! <laughs> we were so chuffed to hear it. And um, just tell me a little bit about the track. Um, I had an image of my, in my head of two things, really. Of people sitting down respectfully, mm. all dressed up, eating a living... Well, sort of eating that body parts. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. Because I struggle with that. I'm, I'm one of these vegans that I struggle... I can't eat in places where there's meat. I have to go to a vegan or at least a vegetarian restaurant. Because I don't like when I'm here and then somebody's eating meat next to me. And it's even worse if you're on the same table. So... I wanted to draw an image of that. And then I wanted to remind people that it doesn't matter how sophisticated you get. It doesn't matter if you're a rocket scientist or how well you dress and all that stuff. You're an animal. Mm. When you get down to it, we are all animals. And we should be as far as possible in solidarity with our other animals. Mm. So it's kind of me showing my solidarity with the animals that these people are eating. And I'm saying, you know, animals will stick together. Yeah. You know. They're all and, earthlings. Yeah, and you know, I know there are animals that eat animals, and there's, you know, we can talk about that for a long time, but we don't need to. I understand that the French went through a period where they stopped calling cow cow and started calling it beef and stuff like that, and they yeah. used lots of fancy words yeah. to kind of cover all Disassociate. The, like, the, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, yeah. And you can see that um, in other cultures as well. And when I say, you know, it, he ate a penis and a lung, he drank the piss and ate the tongue, each one of them was highly strong animals should stick together. I wanted to remind people that that's what they're eating. Do you remember that campaign, Meat for Love, or whatever it's mm. called on television, you know, and they tried to get that romantic setting when people mm. eating meat? Mm. Yeah. Well, the dairy industry have just launched a, uh, a £1.2 million campaign to try and claw back um, some of their revenue since plant-based milks have been so embraced by what some people are calling the post-milk generation now. Mm. So, so with that in mind... What do you think about the recent surge of veganism? And I'll, just, just before I finish, because we, you mentioned before that obviously something about the fashion aspect of it, mm. isn't it? And I think years back, you'd only be into veganism because you understand about the plight of animals and animal rights and speciesism, mm. you know, and the fact we're all earth things. But now there are so many different areas to get into it. You've got fitness, health, yeah. fashion as well. Mm. Hopefully, in my opinion, whatever doorway you get into it, you eventually it opens the doorway to a Pandora's box where hopefully you will understand more about it and it will lead you to animal rights. Mm. What are your thoughts about the upsurge in veganism as of late? I think it's good, but I'm also, I also know that you know, some people will drop off. Mm. Um, I remember years ago, and these figures are com must be completely out of date, they used to say that every month 2,000 people went vegan in England. And so you think, right, give it a couple of years and everybody be vegan. But what happens is a lot, and a lot of them used to be young girls and it was... <laughs> meet a boyfriend who's a vegan and be vegan, then they have an argument and they stop being vegan. A lot of them drop off for whatever reason. Yeah. 
And, and so I think it's going to be a bit like that, probably not so drastic. Yeah. But I still won't badmouth, for want of a better term, those people that give it a try and then they don't make it because sometimes they come back later. There's a phrase, isn't there, sometimes, the angry vegan, because sometimes people can't understand how people can't go vegan and they see the suffering that makes them angry. What do you think about that? Does it do our cause damage? Should there be more understanding? I think we should be more understanding. The people I'm angry with are the people that know better um, and the people who are in the meat industry who know better and who do the murder, (laughs) call Mm. it what it is and who do the enslaving of animals and all that kind of stuff. Those are the people I'm angry with. And, you know, having said that, again, you know, this is my life experience, you've got to leave a little bit of room for people to change. If you shout at people and just get angry with them, for, I'm not going to say for no reason at all, but for stuff that they can't help in that... Well, they've been conditioned for such a exactly. long time. I mean, we've all eaten exactly. meat at some point, you, you know? know. My mum eats, well, at meat, and she... When I said I'd been vegan, I didn't even know the word vegan. I just said I'm stopping eating meat and mm. I'm stopping having no. She just thought, at first she thought it was a phase that I was going to go through, you know, and it would, it would, I would turn around and it would change. And then she was like worried about my health and everything. She said, you must eat some meat, you know. Yeah. And, you know, and that was when I was 13 or something, 14, 15. Now, I'm almost 100. And she, <laughs> she looked at me and she goes, no. Nope. And in fact, the other day she came back after coming, visiting the doctor, looking rather depressed. And he wasn't really depressed, it was confused. And I said, Mum, what's wrong, you know? Because he's just come from the doctor and I think it's bad news. He mm. said, the doctor tell me to eat what you eat. <laughs> you know? And I said, I told you, Mum, why do you have to wait for the man in the white coat to tell you? Yeah. You know, it's been here all the time. We have, we have a member of our family that's worked in health foods and stuff like that. Unfortunately, sometimes society, as a society, we tend to pass our health over to people in white coats yeah, too much, yeah, I think. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so I, I always leave a little bit of room for, for people to change. And there's so much condition in the world. Brainwashing is a very powerful thing. I remember being in Egypt and I was telling some people I was a vegan. And one guy, he got me and he said, I, I need a word with you. And he took me to a corner and he said, you don't eat meat or nothing? I said, no. He said, no meat, no beef? I said, no. He said, you must. You should. I said, why? He said, how can you have the power to make love to the woman? <laughs> when, you, when you get it wrong, you know what I mean? So, was this 100 years ago or was this uh, 2017 no, 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 or something? Like 15, 20 years ago, something like that, you know what I mean? That was part one of my interview with Benjamin Zephaniah. Part two's coming up later in the show. Next up is a song from Benjamin's new album, Revolutionary Minds. The track's called More Animal Rights and it's a complete theme tune for vegans. machines and crooked cops They grin and scheme and fire shots They have the power, we have not Animals must stick together They got criminal injustice acts And all grey men ignoring facts Cops full of evil to the max Animals must stick together I saw murder on their plates I could not count the murder rates I watched them celebrate the hate Animals must stick together They ate a penis and a lung They drank the piss and ate the tongue Each one of them was highly strong Animals must stick together Powerful. The force got international. They could not see their animal. They 
just could not get spiritual. They had to hide to do their deeds, but every animal has needs. As they drank the blood of greed, they failed to overstand the weed. So animals put courage on and letting farmers all be gone. Us animals should stand as one. Animals must stick together. Embrace yourself and keep it true. Seed animal in you. Freeing ourselves is what we do. Animals must stick together. That was Benjamin Zephaniah, More Animal Rights. You can get his new album, Revolutionary Minds, across all good stores. I hope you enjoy it as much as I have. Hey, my name is Benjamin Zephaniah, and I support Viva because Viva support me. They care about every living thing, and you should care too. Viva for Viva. Can you feel that? Next up is Veronica from Viva Health on Radio 4, debating on farming today about the health benefits of drinking milk. From the BBC, the presenter today, Charlotte Smith. Good morning. Today, the move away from milk. I don't think it's young people just shunning milk and dairy products and not knowing what they're doing. I think they're very interested in uh, healthy nutrition in their diet. Now, as farmers gather for the Welsh Dairy Show in Carmarthen today, some are voicing concerns about the rise in milk and dairy-free diets. They worry that the popularity of vegan lifestyles, particularly among younger people, bodes ill for the dairy industry. Well, Tulare Glyn-Jones of BBC Wales has been investigating. Colin, what have we got here then? This looks like a main ring to me. This is the main ring. Uh, as you can see at the bottom end, we have the stalling for the cattle. We have over 130 cattle entered at the Preparations moment. Preparations for the Wales Dairy Show are in full swing. The marquee is up and Colin Evans, the chairman, has been busy putting sawdust down in the main ring. Uh, this is where most of the, well, the indoor trade stands are going to be. This is an industry event. It's for farmers, buyers, breeders, milking machinery salesmen. But beyond these sheds, across the country, and especially in our towns and cities, the way we're eating is changing. I'm in Cardiff at the Anna Loca restaurant. It's lunchtime and there's a brisk trade here. It's one of the many vegan and vegetarian restaurants in the capital. Here's an example of the industry that's growing around the trend towards vegan food. But how popular is veganism? really. Figures from the Vegan Society gathered by Ipsos Mori show there's been an increase in the number of vegans in the UK in 10 years. Back at the showground, it's a trend that concerns farmers like Colin. It must be of concern to us. It all starts off, where was the base to start off with? But no, it must be of concern. Uh, Celebrities are now getting behind promotional drives to veganism or vegetarianism. And we must have the answers ready for these people and to prove that we are looking after animals and we do produce some food in a healthy manner. Recently, the Advertising Standards Authority approved a poster which claimed the dairy industry was inhumane. That was despite objections by the farming industry. According to some, this is a significant change in our attitudes to the milk industry. But according to NFU Cymru, these are extremist views. Here's what shoppers in Llandidno thought. Well, an excess of dairy products doesn't agree with me, so it's just safer not to eat it. Because of diets, a lot of my friends have either got celiacs or have to be dairy-free, gluten-free. If I'm with friends and they are gluten-free or dairy-free, then we go to different restaurants that will help them. Yeah, I like them, I guess, yeah. Fairly conscious, like, I would try and control it a bit, yeah. Like, I don't eat cheese. I don't like it, and also because it's unhealthy. Gareth Richards is a dairy farmer in Abergwilly, just outside Carmarthen. He says he's not worried about the numbers because there are still so few vegans, but he says there's still room for improvement in the image of the industry. It's a lot with our own doing. We don't go out and publicise ourselves enough. 
it's something that we definitely need to do more of whether it's just talking with the public in the supermarket or in farmers markets or around or, or whatever whatever the the chance we get we need to pounce on it and and make the best use as we can out of it. As the industry comes together in Carmarthen to celebrate the best of the Welsh dairy industry, are they doing enough to win the PR battle? To Larry Glyn Jones there with Dairy Farmers in Wales. Well, Veronica Powell is the dairy campaigner for the vegan charity Viva. I think a lot of farmers focus on trying to convince people that uh, dairy is produced in a more sort of ethical way or it's healthier than people think it is. But essentially milk is something that's unnecessary. It's not natural for us to cycle from cows and it's not that healthy. So I don't think any sort of reassurance would change my point of view or, you know, Viva's vegan campaigns. Does it feel to you as though your time has come as a vegan? It's certainly encouraging to see the surge in in the interest in veganism and and from young people too. And I don't think it's young people just shunning milk and dairy products and not knowing what they're doing. I think they're very interested in in healthy nutrition in their diet. It's a healthy move, I think. Well, also joining us is Margaret Raymond, Professor of Nutritional Medicine at the University of Surrey and one of the speakers at the World Dairy Summit, which takes place in Belfast next week. Margaret, do you have concerns about the number of people who perhaps aren't as careful as Veronica might suggest? Well, I have concerns that people aren't aware that if they stop consuming dairy products, that they're actually doing away with the major source of iodine in the diet, in the UK diet. And iodine is absolutely essential. The main time it's essential is when the baby is growing in the womb and its brain is developing incredibly rapidly. And it needs iodine because iodine is a crucial component of thyroid hormones. So if you give up milk and dairy products, that's fine, but you need to get that iodine from somewhere else. And the problem is people aren't aware that if they do give up milk and dairy products, that they need to seek an alternative source. Uh, We've done uh, research into all sorts of aspects of health and nutrition and vegan diets, and there isn't a huge amount of iodine in dairy products. And you Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but actually... More than a third of the iodine that we get in the UK is coming from dairy products, milk and dairy products. Yes, but uh, that means not the majority of iodine is not coming from dairy products. But also iodine is in dairy products predominantly because of the iodine teat dips or the other wash substances Uh, that are used in cows. So it's not really natural. No, that's not actually the reason. Very little of that iodine from teat washes actually gets in to the milk and is bioavailable. It's because the cattle are fed for reproductive purposes to improve their fertility and milk yield. Cattle are fed iodine in their feed. That's the main reason there's iodine in dairy products. If you can get iodine from from milk, where the cow was fed iodine and also had iodine product used on her udders, isn't it better and easier for us to use seaweed, which is an excellent source of iodine, instead? I can tell you that certain seaweeds, particularly kelp and kombu, are extraordinarily high in iodine. You know, there are numerous studies really that show that there is a problem because these seaweed sources are so very high in iodine. It's very easy to overshoot and have too much. Veronica, do you think dairy farmers are right to be a bit concerned about we don't want people like you? We don't want farmers to go bankrupt and you know, end up on the street, but we'd encourage people to look into alternative types of farming. We used to be an iodine deficient country. We used to have goiter. And because of the addition of iodine to cattle feed, we actually managed to get rid of goiter in the population. So you can't just dismiss milk or dairy products as not being an important part of UK health. Professor Margaret Raymond and Veronica Powell. Don't just shout at the radio, you can have your say on the program. Great, well I'm here with the duo that is, the Vegan Recipe Club. I'm here with Marianne, how are you doing? Hello, I'm good, thank you. And Jane. Hello. (laughs) Brilliant. Listen, I wanted to bring you in because we at Viva and Vegan Recipe Club have a rebrand of 30 Day Vegan. So why the rebrand? Well, we decided to do a rebrand of the 30 Day Vegan because it was looking a bit old and tired. It had been very successful. We'd had thousands of people subscribing to it, really good feedback. We, we looked at it again and we just realised it needed a bit of an upgrade and we could do better and we could provide more 
options for people. So that's what we did, really. How long has 30 Day Vegan been around? Okay, 30 Day Vegan has been going around for about three years before mm. we upgraded it. So we kind of had a similar idea right about the same time as Veganuary. Room. We, we'd started planning ours before they launched and then we hang, hung back so that they could do their first launch in that first January of 2014, I think it was. And then we did, we followed on. So ours is something you can use all the year round, not just January. Theirs is specifically aimed at people post Christmas, really. Mm, it's looking really, really slick. It looks absolutely amazing. So, Marianne, you were responsible for the photographs, weren't you? I was, yes, yes. I had the really awful job of cooking all Jane's amazing recipes and then taking pictures of them. Um, so I've got to know the recipes really, really well over the last sort of five months. Um, cooked up every single one of them. And I can honestly say that they are delicious, accessible, straightforward and budget conscious and mm. healthy, I should add, as yeah. well, most of them. But we do like to um, add some indulgences. It's a broad range. So if you get home, you know, get home from work and you're not sure what to cook and you don't want to go out and, you know, get a long list of ingredients, they're really, really accessible. Mm. So it's all shop-bought, under an hour sort of recipes, Yeah, easy for very, the novice as well. Very accessible. Um, and Jane has created... A phenomenal amount of information about where to buy products, you know, what certain products are, you know, kind of dispelling some of the myths around mm. vegan cooking and making it so accessible and easy for people to get out there and, and do it in a very straightforward way. Well, that's the point of 30 Day Vegan, is it? To encourage people to cook vegan food and show them how easy it is. Just out of interest, how many recipes did you have to cook then over these last five months? Because you haven't been in the office hardly at all. Have you? <laughs> yeah, uh, it, um, I, it was it was well over a hundred. Well actually. over a hundred recipes. <laughs> so. What does it actually look like? This new thirty day vegan. It looks different because the web team have done a fantastic job of redesigning the whole site. So it looks really stunning visually. It's very impressive. We've obviously got Marianne's fantastic new photographs, so that's another thing. But the other thing that makes it different is that we've got the new can't cook, won't cook section, which is something slightly different from what we had before. So the original, the regular 30-day vegan, as we call it, is kind of more or less cooked from scratch. And what we've done with the can't cook section is that that's kind of similar sorts of recipes, but using shop-bought convenience tools and things like that. So like buy a tin of this or a packet of that or, you know, a carton of ready slice, something or other for people who really either hate cooking or are just really, really busy and time pressed. So it's basically something for everyone. So we've really kind of pushed the boat out to make this as accessible to everybody's kind of needs as possible. It's also got the added function that you can challenge your friends to take the 30-day vegan program. So if you know some people who are vegan curious or if they just like some delicious new recipes or if they're meat reducers, then you've got that added option of, of putting their email address in and then they get an invitation. What about recipes? Have got any favourites on there? Well, I've got some favourites. I mean, I like them all. Obviously, I would say that because I've devised them all. Um, but things like the easy summer tart with asparagus, peas and white bean hummus is one of my personal favourites because it makes a great picnic thing that you can sort of take with you. It's very easy to rustle up because you just use a sheet of ready-rolled vegan puff pastry. The other thing I love is a super fast scrambled tofu, which is actually a recipe of Mary Ann's, which is, uses silk and tofu for this really creamy, lovely, quick scrambled tofu. Oh, it's one of the nice re- nice I've had I've it had. so many times and I absolutely <laughs> adore it and what about you Maria my favorite yeah. right well my top is probably the bean burgers they are actually the most popular recipe on the vegan recipe club right. website and I can see why <laughs> because yeah. they're just they are so tasty I couldn't believe how good this recipe was when I first tried it but they're easy it's such a short list of ingredients and they are absolutely gorgeous mm. um, and they're so versatile as well you can eat them you know barbecues friends houses mm. freeze them is that yeah. on the 30 day vegan side on the 30 day vegan side yeah and we've also actually just made a new spangly cookery video to go with them so you'll be able to see how to make them really easily brilliant um, another one of my favorites is the french toast vegan style again not something I'd ever thought to make and tried it and you replace the egg essentially with silk and tofu so this is like eggy bread yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right vegan yeah obviously bread. without Wicked. the egg <laughs> yeah um, covered in maple syrup vegan yogurt and blueberry is absolutely gorgeous I couldn't I, mm. again I couldn't believe how good it was and it looks beautiful um 
another favourite. Sorry, I've got lots of Come favourites. Come blimey, all right. Yeah, roll them out then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love the fact that James put a uh, an ice cream recipe for breakfast. Well, not I've got to put it's super healthy ice cream, <laughs> but um, it is actually made with um, br- uh, Brazil nuts primarily oh, um, and dates. Yeah. And I just can't believe it. it's about three ingredients: it's Brazil nuts, dates, and ice cubes. Is there a little bit of flavour? Yeah, there, yeah, there's banana. some fruit and things. Well, I just blend it up and yeah. freeze it, up. it for a yeah. bit. Yeah. Unbelievable how it comes Working. out! Yeah. It's absolutely hey, gorgeous. My kids might like that. They yeah. Give that a go, isn't it? It's definitely an all-round pleaser for sure. Yeah. Great way of getting fruit down children's necks. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've just suddenly sure. seen that you've got a huge list of recipes there. That I'm, I've got a funny feeling you're going to be going through them as your favourites, each and every one. <laughs> so look, I'm going to I'm going to knock it on the head here. <laughs> Let's go straight through to the social media links. 30 Day Vegan yeah. what's been launched. Yeah. What's the so links? It's 30dayvegan.viva.org.uk. That's okay. the home page. So you can sign up as an individual there. And you've also then got the option to challenge your friend if you want to um, sign them up. Brilliant. Okay. There's also a really simple code um, that you could have log in with. And as Marianne said, it's very easy to log in. But, but you can also log in. You can also sign up for both of the schemes if you want, as well as you get them two two lots of recipes coming into your mailbox every day if you want. If not, just choose one. You can always go back to it later if you just decide you'd like a change. What's, this, means... what's this code thing you're talking about? Uh huh. Well, <laughs> there's a very. I can't give it away. I like it? vegan ice cream in the morning. <laughs> no, they might. Have to, no, I can't give it away. They might have to kill me. No, you have to go onto the site, <laughs> and you'll see it embedded in a little text that you just read before, and then you sign in a little oh. form. It's very, very simple, very quick to do. Mm. But very clever. Yeah, for us non-IT very people. Now. <laughs> Brilliant! Look, thanks so much for coming in. We're really excited about launching Thirty Day Vegan today, and it's going to be available to everybody for free forevermore. Yeah, yeah. Good work, right? You Thank guys you have made me much. hungry, so uh, <laughs> let's go get some food. Thanks. <laughs> Welcome to the Voice of Europe's largest vegan campaigning charity. My name's Chris Townsend, and as usual, I present the show. And guess what? It's World Vegan Day. Coming up is part two of my interview with Benjamin Zephaniah. I promote with organisations like Viva and stuff like that on occasion. But most of the time, I, I want to make people aware of what's going on in the world. Mm. I don't even want to get them to convert because of me. This may sound strange because I'm talking to a fellow vegan and this is a kind of vegan platform. But I've had people, especially kids, that... After they read Talking Turkeys, a children's book of mine, some other things, they write to me and they say, I read your book and I'm going to be a vegan. And I write back and say, no, don't be a vegan because of me. When somebody questions you to say, why you be a vegan? You say, because I like Benjamin Zephaniah and he's a vegan. Mm. But I perhaps your book inspired them, though. Well, no. I mean? It wasn't necessarily you. Maybe well, yeah, story, yeah. You know? I mean, it, it's... it's if the, I almost want them to, to prove to me that, you know, they really feel it. And it's mm. not just me. It's not just my personality. It's not that they just like the poem Talking Turkeys or something like that. Mm. And to be honest, they always go away and think about it. That's a really interesting point, actually. How did you, what made you want to write a, a children's book or, or kids' books and poetry? I started writing poetry when I was a kid. And, yeah. and, and I, I was one of these people back in the day that said, oh, there's no such thing as black poetry or white poetry or kids' poetry. It's just poetry. Mm. And then... Two things happened, really. A teacher was telling me that she was teaching my poetry in school and she'd have the book and she'd have to cover one page and show the other page because one page was not suitable. And then somebody also said to me that kids like their own books. Mm -hmm. They don't want to share a book with mum and dad. Mm -hmm. They like to have their own books in their room, you know, and uh, that's why you should do it, a children's book. Yeah. And that's what I did. I did um, Talking Turkeys. And as you probably know, it was like really popular I don't don't know how many it sold but it keeps selling they've just repackaged it actually and just re-released it Um, and I think why that was popular at the time it's interesting it was at a time when writing for kids wasn't that popular now everybody you know especially comedians you know Mm. I mean they want to they think oh I'm funny with adults let me be funny with kids and let me write you know (laughs) but what I can say about my especially talking turkeys I mean I've written four books for children and they're still going they still you know um keep me in food and whatever um, is because and I know this because I speak to the, the, the readers because when I talk about nice fluffy animals it's just not about fluffy animals having a party sometimes I write about them going to slaughter mm. sometimes I write about fox hunting you yeah. know, and they go yeah this is real sometimes a bit depressing in my first book there was a poem called Danny the Cat and it's about this cat of mine called Danny 
my then girlfriend was crying her eyes out. Some kids had got Danny and kicked him to death down the road. And so if you look in the next book, um, Funky Chickens, there's a poem called Danny Lives On, and it describes the way he dies. Because, you know, there are some kids that do this to cats. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, I wanted to put the reality of that in a children's book. I just think kids like that honesty. Sometimes it's brutal, sometimes it's sad. Mm. But they like that honesty because that's the reality. Yeah, I mean, as a vegan dad, it is always a question as to how much we tell our children. Yeah. And obviously you don't want to lie to kids about the food chain, about what's going on, and you want to make them aware of the realities behind it. So, Viva, I mean, you've been a patron of Viva now for many years, which is absolutely fantastic. What do you think about the work that Viva do and the work that we've been doing of late? I think it's great. I always thought of you as us, because I'm kind of mm. technically one of you, as yeah. like the educational arm of the struggle, you know. I think it's really, really important. We were talking earlier about brainwashing and stuff like that, you know, Education is the key. Some people do change, and sometimes they don't change on the spot. They get thinking, but they won't forget it. Plant a seed. Sometimes, when we're trying to get the world to think about animals and themselves, actually, their own health and well-being, and, and this points back to that question about angry vegans, that a lot of what we do, we won't see the results of it straight away. Sometimes mm. we don't see it in our lifetime. What you're doing is, like really really important with something that you truly believe in you don't have a choice anyway you don't do it for instant gratification change does happen slowly on a mass scale doesn't yeah. it but in between that huge change there's lots of little changes and lots of little yes, successes yeah, that we yes, can have to yeah. boost us on our on our path yeah. isn't it on now, our way the history of animal rights and veganism when someone tells the history of it in the future these last 10 years is going to be really really important the way people have changed the way supermarkets have changed. In my local Morrison's, they've got a whole vegan ice cream section, yeah. you know? Yeah. Do you know what? That's one of the things I love about working at Viva. Probably the worst part of the job is seeing all the footage and mm. being exposed mm. to it all the time. But the best part is knowing that I'm working with the group of people that are creating change on a big scale. No, I can remember when we were doing the um, kangaroo meat campaign yeah. and all that stuff, you know? And, you know, people were talking about it and it kind of just had an effect on people, you know? People mm. were kind of Kangaroo, we eat kangaroo. I mean, I'm one of these people that think meat is meat, you know, but I guess, you know, when I first went to China, I went to the Guangzhou, and one of the first restaurants I saw, it looked like a pet shop, it just had cats in the window, and then I realised it was a restaurant, and you'd get kids look at the cat and go, that's really cute, I'll have that one. And then 15 minutes later, it's on his plate and it's eating it. And then I went, like, you know, a bit north, and I said to these Chinese people, oh, you know, you Chinese people, you eat cats? And they went, no, no, the people down south, they eat cats. What's wrong with dog? You know, and then you go a bit north and these people say, uh, yeah, we don't eat dog, you know. Snake's good, snake's good. So if you eat meat, you eat meat. Certain people will get irate about eating one kind of meat or another. I met a woman from the RSPCA the other day who was like really caring about cats and dogs and everything. And when I said, you know, what about the beef you eat and everything? She was like, oh no, that's different, yeah. you know. And so... We've got to work on so many fronts, and it's when we kind of... That's why I just think, I wish everybody would meditate. The more you meditate, and you want to get to that level where you relax, you, you kind of have to be vegan to get there. Mm. And that's why a lot of the Buddhists and Zen Buddhists, they won't preach it. They'll say it will happen naturally, because you, your conscience, you need to clear your conscience. Actually, if you've argued with your wife and you need to apologise, you go and do it. Mm. Because you need to get rid of all that stuff before you can reach Because it builds level. quickly, doesn't it? Yeah. The, the, the noise and yeah. everything. Yeah. So do you think veganism and spirituality are linked in that way? I do. You practice yoga. Mm. God, they don't believe that God is out there. They believe it's just God is self. Mm. So you get to know yourself. You unite with yourself. Mm. Mm. That's what well, it means. Do you know what? I mean, that's one of the things about Buddhism that really attracted me as, as, a, as a youngster. It was the fact that it didn't have an external no, God. No. It was more about, you know, yeah. sort of what's within and stuff yeah, as well. Yeah. But that's one of the things me and Mariana found really confusing is the fact that lots of the Buddhists that we meet when we go to mindfulness classes and meditation groups, etc., a lot of them are just vegetarian and they're yeah, not vegan yeah. and it's been something that we've Some talked about meat. a lot. Dalai Lama eats yeah, meat. Yeah. You know? um, the thing with Buddhism is that it, it says that you can you know, look at the Buddhists, what the Buddhists are doing in Burma, mm. in Myanmar, I mean they're fucking killing people and the same thing was happening in um, Sri Lanka 
Buddhists for killing Tamils, you know. These are people that should never kill a fly. Yeah. But the thing with Buddhism is it says that it's left to your own conscience and eventually you will, if you want to reach the higher stage, you will have to give up meat. You will have to give up killing. It's like all these people that are jumping on the bandwagon that are going to drop along the wayside. Because yeah. my thing is, people come to me as a vegan, they go, what would you do if you were in the desert, right? And then you saw a cow. Wouldn't you eat the cow? And I go, I'll ask how the cow got there. <laughs> because if it's a cow, it must have been something. So I'm going to follow the cow's footsteps back yeah. and find where the cow come yeah. from, you know? Um, so I, I, I have, but I can, you know, I can see the kind of logic, although mm. I think it's flawed. So for me, it's about kind of having a clear conscience. You can just be a vegan because you like vegetarian food or whatever, you like vegan food. Um, and it's so in vogue. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can just do it for health reasons. You know, yeah. Some people do it for health reasons, some people for ethical reasons. You know, I, for me, it's a combination of all. All of it, isn't it? I don't think you have to be a spiritual person to be a vegan. But I, to me, I think it really helps. But I can understand if somebody says, well, I'm an atheist or I don't believe in spirits at all, I don't believe in Buddhism, I don't believe in anything. But, you know, for me, it's all about the rights of the animal. The future of veganism, mm. do you think it's realistic to think that with the increase in veganism now in the world, we could see a world where people are mostly vegan? I think so. I do think it's going to happen. Just like people find lots of practices that we did in the, in the past outrageous, I think kind of killing animals and eating them will be seen as crazy mm. and, and unhealthy. So, yeah, I think it will happen. But we've still got to fight. We've still got to fight on all different fronts, on the educational front, on the animal rights front. People will realise that there's another way. The future's coming. Yeah. Mm. Benjamin, thank you very much for the it's interview, cool. brother. Yeah. Nice one, Take man. care. I love you too, man. And that was part two of my interview with Viva patron Benjamin Zephaniah. I really enjoyed meeting Benjamin, a very inspiring character. Viva's undercover exposés are changing the face of Britain. Every year, millions of people see the true face of animal farming because of us, and they're changing their diet. Meat and dairy consumption is falling. By joining Viva, your donation will help to keep up this vital work. We need your support. Join Viva today so we can keep on saving animals from suffering. Join online at viva.org.uk forward slash join. Viva.org.uk forward slash join. So as you all know, we hold vegan festivals up and down the country. And I must say, it's one of my favourite parts of the job. Uh, being able to see all the store holders, eat my way around the festival, and obviously see so many Viva supporters there. So I'm here with Sophie now anyway, because she's going to tell us all about the next one. How are you doing? Hi there, I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, good. I think we're both really busy, aren't we? Yes, as always. <laughs> yeah, so how's it going for Sheffield? It's great. I've just been on the phone with the venue manager this morning, actually getting all the preparations ready and floor plans. It's very exciting. Mm. So the Sheffield Viva Vegan Festival is taking place on Saturday, the 18th of November at the Mega Centre. Okay, so that's Saturday the 18th of November at the Mega Centre. What's that like? The Mega Centre is basically a purpose-built, like, huge events room, really. Um, so it's going to be ideal. We've got a huge, huge space just full of stall holders. So there's going to be tons Great. of food, clothes, cosmetics, all that kind of stuff for mm. ethical and conscious living. Yeah, good stuff. So is that that's all just one big room then? One yep. big hall? Great. Yep. So that's quite cool, isn't it? Yeah, and then on the, uh, we do have a floor above that's going to have talks and demos um, above that. Ah, uh, what about yeah. talks and demos? So who's going to be um, talking and demo? <laughs> so we have Epi Vegan, a YouTuber, doing a great cookery demo for us. Okay, do you know, um, what, he's, do you know what he's going to be cooking up? He hasn't told me yet. I keep, <laughs> I keep asking him, but I know it's going to be something good. If you watch his YouTube videos, he always makes really yummy dishes. So and how, what, do you know what his YouTube channel is? Uh, it's Epi Vegan, so if you search yep. that, you'll find him. And it's E-P-I Vegan. All one word. Oh, one word. Yep. And then we have Tony Wardle from Viva, editor of Viva Life magazine Great. and author of Pod. His talks are always super popular. He's yeah. doing two talks. What are they? So he'll be great to see. Dairy beef and... Wee, that's the old classic, <laughs> isn't it? And why you don't need dairy. Great. Okay, mm. brilliant. But they're always full as well. So yeah. if you haven't heard Tony um, do any of those talks, get to it because he's got a, lo- a bag full of personality and passion as he's well. He's a great go public speaker. Mm, mm. Yeah, really good. He's got a great mm. voice as well, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. So, so what else? 
Um, so there's going to be a hundred stalls there. So there's going to be absolutely loads of stuff to look around. Mm. There's a nice. We've got a lovely seating area. So there's space for you guys to like. Once people get their lunch and food, they can take it and chill out and sit down and relax. There's also a kids zone, which is completely free. It's going to be just a little room for. So it's a completely family friendly event. Okay. So anyone with kids can, you know, there's a space where there's toys and keep the kids entertained. Yeah, quite. Can, can they leave them there? <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, they do have to be supervised. That doesn't come with child care. That would be a good pull. Wouldn't Can't it? Ab- Bands on them there, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, food store wise, I mean, you know, um, as I've done so many of these festivals, I've gotten to know quite a few of the store holders that do the food. And there's certain bankers that I really look forward to, to mm. being there, like the Vegan Cakery, Mex It Up. But the last one we did, there was, oh my God, I had the best vegan kebab ever. And it was herbivorous, was it? Yeah, herbivorous. Herbivorous. Oh, herbivorous. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think, you know what? I actually am not sure off the top of my head if they're coming yet or not. If but they're not. They yeah. are coming to my next Bristol festival, which yes. I'm really excited about because they were incredible. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah. Okay, so how much is it to get in? So it's £3 entry and the tickets are available on the door. We also have a few VIP tickets left. Um, details of how to get VIP tickets are on the website, which is viva.org.uk forward slash Sheffield. Um, these come with a no queue entry and a goodie bag full of treats. Mm. Um, so we've got loads of great um, businesses that donate stuff to us. So there's yeah. going to be loads of stuff in there. Oh, good stuff. It's always good to leave with a goodie bag, isn't mm. it, when you get home? I've had a couple of them myself and yeah. I've always looked forward to it. Well, look, thanks, Sophie. I appreciate you're busy, so I'm going to leave you to it. But for everybody that hasn't heard this before, Sheffield, when's the date? 18th of November. Okay, we'll see you there. As a nation of animal lovers, it's not surprising that Britain is seeing a very steady decline in the demand for animal-based products. Now, Viva wants to encourage more people to opt for a compassionate lifestyle, and we used a very unconventional technique to reach the masses with this campaign. As part of a week-long tour, we have hired a video van which showed video footage exploring the stark comparison between the lives of pigs on our sanctuary to those in factory farms destined for the dinner plates. Now, earlier this year... Some of you, most of you will know probably, Viva and Dean Farm Animal Sanctuary, we rescued a sow and her six piglets from a farm where they faced certain death. Observing the family living really happily and free inspired us to be able to share the story with the public and embark on this video van tour. You know, we denounced the claim that the UK has the best animal welfare standards in the world. In fact, 90% of pigs raised in the UK are intensively farmed, which means they're kept inside. Often with no bedding, we've seen it. Squalid, filthy pens and are subjected to countless barbaric farming practices. We actually carried a survey out in 2016 that found 88% of people have no idea that most pigs are killed at just six months old, despite having a natural life expectancy of around 15 years, as well as 40% actually not realising that removing the end of piglets' tails without anaesthetic was not illegal, and 38% didn't think that farmers were allowed to keep breeding female pigs in farrowing crates for up to five weeks at a time, which also actually prevents them from turning round. It's all legal. That's the problem. Now, in addition to the video van, we also offered the public the opportunity to view undercover footage taken from the UK factory farms on virtual reality headsets. You know, we're just going around demonstrating that a meat-free diet can be tasty. I'd like to give a big thank you for Laura who embarked on that tour and travelled around many different cities. We did Bristol, Bath, Birmingham, Coventry, London, Brighton and Oxford one day after the other and she did a cracking job. Here's the feedback from the public. Oh, they're so cute. They're so... Look at the little tails. Oh, they're so sweet. Oh, we shouldn't be eating them at all. It's quite nice to understand kind of what's happening and then understand, to make, be able to make the conscious choice to eat it or not eat it, understanding what's going on. I've been trying to be vegan for a while now and then I saw this um, screen in the city centre and it convinced me to be vegan. And I'm going to subscribe at the 30 Day Vegan. I am a meat eater. And I do find things like this make you think about, and I find them hard to watch. So they do make you think, reconsider it all. And that was a section on our recent video van tour.
Next up, we hear from Dr. Michael Greger, patron of Viva and author of How Not to Die, and also creator of NutritionFacts.org. This is where he helps us understand B12 and where it comes from. The section's called, If Humans Were Vegan, Why Do We Need B12? A lot of meat eaters ask us about B12. If humans are really supposed to be vegan, then why do we have to take a B12 supplement? Surely the fact that we have to take a supplement means that humans are not designed to be strictly plant eaters. Well, I beg to differ, and so does Dr. Michael Greger. Do vitamin B12 supplements debunk veganism then, is their opinion? Do we have to eat animal products to get vitamin B12? Does the vitamin B12 issue prove that we are omnivores? Do meat eaters get vitamin B12 deficiencies as well? So keep listening as Dr. Michael Greger answers these questions. Big thanks to Plant Based Science London for this as well. Vitamin B12, which is a vitamin not made by plants, but it's not made by animals either. It's made by tiny microbes that blanket the earth. We probably used to get all we needed drinking out of a mountain stream or well water, but now we chlorinate our water supply to kill off the bacteria. So we don't get a lot of B12 in our water anymore. We don't get a lot of cholera either. And so in this kind of hygienic world, in a sanitized world, which again is a very good thing, that's the one kind of Achilles heel, but it's just because, you know, we you know, aren't eating, you know, bugs, dirt, and feces anymore, but that's a good thing. Um, unless one is eating bacteria-laden animals and products from those animals, one needs to get their B12 somewhere. And so the safest way to get it is through B12 supplements or B12-fortified foods, but it's just so easy. And you can't get too much of it. You just pee it right out. It's cheap, about $5 a year, get all the B12 you need. And that's kind of your ticket to get all the amazing benefits in terms of astoundingly low you know, obesity rates and diabetes rates and heart disease and some types of strokes, some types of cancer. The vast majority of people with B12 deficiency are um, meat eaters over the age of 50. So the American Academy of Neurology says that everybody after the age of 50 needs to take, you know, B12 fortified foods or, or B12 supplements because there's actually kind of an epidemic of B12 deficiency among our elderly. Uh, the uh, Framingham Offspring Study, for example, showed that many meat eaters, even in their 30s and 40s, are uh, B12 deficient. And that study, the people with the best B12 status weren't the people eating meat, dairy, and eggs. It was the people eating breakfast cereal. Like, you know, they all have B12 added to them. We're finding out that you know, animal products are not such good sources. After all, a very small percentage of the B12 is, is actually bioavailable. And when we think of deficiencies, you know, when, uh, you know, the media says, you know, what are vegans deficient in? No one asks the meat eaters what they're deficient in. And they're deficient five, maybe seven nutrients in many studies. You know, the very few nutrients that uh, vegans, vegetarians would run into problems with. And you have to ask, well, wait a second. Where are the meat eaters getting their fiber? Where are they getting their vitamin C found in plant foods? And where are they getting their folate and their phytonutrients and many of the uh, minerals found in greens and beans and nuts? Viva Shop. We lovingly handpick our merchandise, scouring the planet for animal-free amazingness and handcrafted herbivore delights. For the best in vegan-friendly beauty, books, clothing, accessories, food and gifts, shop kind at the Viva Shop. Go to vivashop.org.uk. That's vivashop.org.uk. Well, that's it for another episode. You've been listening to Chris Townsend presenting the birthday World Vegan Day edition of the Viva podcast. We really hope you enjoyed the show. Please remember to share the show where possible. Subscribe. Listen anytime. It's available on all major networks, including Apple Podcasts, Google Play. The list goes on. Until next time, be kind, look after each other, keep showing the public how positive veganism is, and let's hook up again next month. <laughs> <laughs>